I am going to be giving the presentation tonight on Drew Carhart, a uh, long time member. And the uh, presentation, as you probably already all know um, from having read the newsletter and whatever, is about our clubs, Second Observatory, our DuPage Valley Observatory, and the project which we're just completing now to uh, change the equipment out in it. But I want to start out with just a brief recap of history so you can see where all this project sort of fits into the, uh, the story of things. Um, here's our little history. Started out in the early 1970s, we built the first Riley Observatory, a little cylindrical building. Uh, if you skip forward 18 years, I think, uh, into the 1990s, we uh, built the rebuilt the Riley Observatory as a larger building with better equipped. If you skip forward again uh, to the early 2000s, we built the DuPage Valley Observatory in a new spot and then moved the uh, Riley Observatory to join it. So they are, the two buildings together make our Astronomy Education Center. The picture down on the bottom there, it was the dedication of the new facility there. So uh, okay. um, it doesn't feature the deck and uh, light blocking fence that are in there now, which came more recently. So uh, talking about the DuPage Valley Observatory in itself, um, why did we build a second observatory when we already had the first one? Well, there it was interest amongst the members. There's always been interest <laughs> since the early 1970s and up to today in astrophotography. And uh, so there was a lot of discussion of putting in a second telescope that was geared to doing astrophotography when our first telescope, the main one in the Riley Observatory, never has been. That's always been uh, designed and installed to be a visual telescope. Um, so again, there had been a lot of talk about this. We decided to go ahead and the, the circumstances were right to build the second building. But then while we were completing it, we really started to look more into the details of doing astrophotography at the time, and uh, what really became clear was that it sounded like a neat idea, but that when we started really asking for commitments from members to use a nicely equipped digital astrophotography setup that the club owned, there really wasn't very much interest in it. People were interested in doing astrophotography with their own equipment or learning how to do it, or learning more about it, or playing with it a little bit, but not seriously using a setup that belonged to the club. So there was more reconsideration about how we were going to outfit the, uh, the DuPage Valley Observatory, and the uh, idea changed to from doing astrophotography, where you're <coughs> taking pic digital pictures and bringing them home and processing them and coming out with nice magazine quality stills and stuff, to doing live video astronomy. And the rationale for that was really pretty simple in that over the years, we had lost the sky. Um, this is the 1970s picture is actually out of the shutter of the Glenn D. Riley Observatory in the 1970s. The sky over where the buildings are now I would testify in court was as dark as anywhere in Illinois is today, um, just four miles outside of Naperville. And of course, in the interim, it's gone from that to being a daytime sky, 24 hours a day, pretty much. So what we lost in that was the ability to have people come and look through our telescopes and see the fainter objects with their eyes. Um, even with large telescopes, if the sky background is as bright as this galaxy or this nebula or whatever, you're just not going to see much of anything of it uh, visually. So the hope was that with a video system, we could cheat our way around that sum and provide live imaging of fainter things still from under Naperville skies. So uh, that system was designed and we began the construction of it. John Abrahamian refigured the mirror for the 12 and a half inch that we already had to a really nice fast f3.6 to enable us to do the live work where you need a fast system. Um, I'm speaking about fast 
in the camera sense for those of you who use cameras and can think of something that's F4 as being faster than an F22 or whatever. Um, you get a brighter image quicker with the faster system. Um, so we designed the, uh, tele redesigned the telescope to be optimized for that. Uh, we started out uh, with building it around the uh, Stellacam video camera, which is again, a, it's a closed-circuit TV camera. And uh, the center picture there is uh, the night of the first light with that setup. It's M13 on the TV monitor there. And uh, the pictures on the far right there are just screenshots, you know, you know taking the camera and pointing at the TV monitor. Of, you see the dumbbell and the, the Omega Nebula there. So the system worked really well. Uh, we took that perpetually, back at this time in the early 2000s, perpetually muddy yellow sky and we could make it artificially black on the TV monitors and take the little bit of light, extra light left from the objects and, and really magnify it out. So uh, we could provide a dark sky view of things live to people uh, on the TV monitors. So that system worked pretty well. Uh, as the years went by, the Stellacam wore out. Um, CCD chips, which is what that had in it, um, wear out over time. They started getting lots of hot pixels in them. We switched to a color camera and uh, got similar results, but this time in color for the nebulas and things. So again, we were really successful in that goal of uh, being able to pull fainter things. I'm putting up pictures of bright stuff because they're spectacular, um, but we could go quite a bit fainter too. Um, my, I did a lot of playing with the set in the first years of it, and. Uh, I had the Stellacam down to below 17th magnitude galaxies, which is pretty good under a third magnitude sky. So, and again, not by taking multiple or long exposures or computer processing, but just on a TV monitor live in real time. So it worked pretty well. Um, but there were two pretty major issues with the CCTV system um, that kind of plagued us throughout time. Uh, first off, this camera sits at prime focus in the telescope, so there's no other lenses, there's no uh, intermediate lenses, there's no eyepieces or anything that are changeable. The camera is right at prime focus, so you only have one magnification, and for the setup we had, that magnification was something comparable to about 200 power in a uh, telescope that you're looking through with an eyepiece. So that makes it really hard to find things. People always had trouble finding things because you don't have to be off by very far to have it out of the view of a 200 power eyepiece. Um, I don't know who here goes out and tries to find things that starts out with their 200 power eyepiece you know, to locate objects. Not, not too many people do. So that was always a perennial problem. And then the other problem was, and continues to be, that the CCTV stuff is going away. Um, there's not much equipment out there because digital is so uh, much more predominant, is more effective. So uh, there's not much of a future in it. So the answer ended up being to switch from a TV system to a digital imaging system. And that's what this project we've been doing for the past year or so has been, um, was this total change in technology from TV camera to uh, digital camera, which of course means computer, so uh, it's adding a lot more to the system. So what we uh, have gone with, the main camera now for the imaging is this ZWO 2600MC Crow, did I get that right? Yeah. I did. Um, it's a nice camera, it's got a huge chip in it. Um, I just got it. It's got really no low noise and uh, a high sensitivity. It's fairly prime for doing uh, uh, live imaging uh, or electronically assisted astronomy, as some people call it. Um, to talk about the chip size, this diagram shows just a scale idea. The black circle being the size of the nose piece for an inch and a quarter, uh, fitting for a camera to fit into your uh, focuser. The chip from the Celecam was the size of the little tan rectangle inside. 
So that's how much of the field of view of the telescope we were capturing. The green rectangle is the maximum thing you could fit into that inch and a quarter thing, and it also happens to be the exact same size as this chip in this camera. So we pushed out to the limit of what we can do with the focuser setup we've got. Um, and uh, it makes a big difference. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, well, I'll get into it right here. So uh, again, here we are, M13, filling the screen with the Stellacam, with our uh, video camera set up. Um, if we look at what we get now, this was first light a month or so ago with the uh, new camera in place you can see there's a lot more sky around M13 there. Now I'll point out right off the bat, all of you optics and, and imaging enthusiasts will notice the vignetting in the corners. That was actually, it's not as bad as I expected it to be. Um, that's because the tube is clipping right along the edge of the chip there. So there's only light coming in from one angle and not from uh, a wider angle along the, in those, in those corners. We can get rid of that if we want to. We can do a uh, flat frame and have the computer process that in, in our live imaging and brighten those corners back out. But I haven't been in a real hurry to do that in the shakedown stuff that we've been doing so far because I don't think we're gonna use the whole image for much of anything other than finding things. And you can see stars all the way into those corners. They're just dimmed because of the getting um, so you can go out to full chip, get this lovely view, which again comes out to be something more like a 40 power view than, rather than the 200 power view, and find things. Um, the thing that was just out of the field and you couldn't see before is now easily in that field and you can center it on it uh, much more easily. I will say right off the bat, I've been doing this and boy, it's a lot easier to just zoom out to low power and say, oh, there it is, and then center it in. It's already much quicker to use. But uh, again, I don't, there aren't that many objects that are going to be big enough that we're going to be doing deep sky things and needing to pull out to the full field. We'll do a flat field one of these days and, uh, and have it available. But then once you've got something centered, you can zoom in with the software. And I should have taken a longer exposure to be more comparable like this. but. Uh, this is more like the 200 power that we always were stuck at before, but with the uh, new camera, the uh, resolution is so much higher. This is a TV camera, so it basically has 500 lines of resolution in it. Um, this has thousands, and uh, so even zoomed in to a comparable magnification, there's much higher resolution with the new camera than with the video cameras. So we're, we're, we're gaining there in theory, not losing. Um, oh, I guess I should say, if somebody has a question that's about the thing I'm talking about, feel free to raise your hand or say hey or whatever. So, uh, yes, there's a question. <laughs> so on the camera, it had uh, USB 3.0 in to the camera. Uh, that's, the, no, that's, the, uh, well, that's the camera to computer connection. And then there's a, uh, another USB, there's a pair of USB ports on the camera, but those are from a hub inside the camera to go on to something else. So there's one channel for talking back to the, between the computer and the camera. Right, but that's, the, the, three, that's the USB 3, Why? Well, I think, is that probably how I read that right? Yeah, yeah, it's 3.1 is what they classify it as. Why do you need yeah. that fast going in when you should have it going out when you're trying Well, that to is the going out. That's the back and forth between the, oh, okay. the camera and the computer. Right. These, cam okay. these cameras can do video. You sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. You know, 200 frames a second. Or just want, I wonder why there's a spare seat. Well, they have two. There's two. Oh, there's there's like the other two are hubs. The, the, those are downstream hubs that can go off. And they're USB 2.0 and you can hook them up to your electronic focus server. Your focus guide server, guide. Your, uh, yeah, your, guide, your other guide thing or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Are the colors in the upper left uh, image there relatively accurate? Um, it's, that's one of the things you can adjust tremendously on the camera. I'm seeing what appears to be at about the four o'clock position. Yeah, a really blue dot. A blue star. I'm wondering if you've yeah. detected a Bruce Dragger that nobody else knows about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't guarantee. Um, 
there, I will blush to admit it, if you set the game right on this brand new $2,000 camera, there are a few hot pixels already. I don't think they're that bad. Uh, that looks like something actually in the image. But uh, um, the color adjustment is something, is one of the uh, set of parameters that you can adjust pretty uh, strongly. And uh, it's kind of weird in that you can only adjust the red and the blue You've got to do those on either side of the green because you can't do it with the green, but it's still, you can get to what you want. But uh, anyway, um, so this is what we're looking at uh, in comparison to the old system. Um, here's the computer. It's a, we built it for this application. It's uh, got all the ports, it's got all the speed, everything we need, all the memory to do the imaging stuff. It's a Windows PC. It's located in the office room of the uh, DBO, the library room. So it's in the temperature control area there. All that's in the uh, observing room is a wireless keyboard and mouse and uh, the connections that go out to the camera and to the mount, the cameras, I should say. We'll get into the other things. Um, so the camera sits at prime focus, just like they, the video cameras did of the uh, 12 and a half inch telescope. It takes up a little more space, cuts out a little more light, but that's the price. Instead of being an inch and a half cube, it's a three inch cylinder. So, uh, uh, it does have uh, Peltier cooling on it, through electric cooling on it, which we probably won't use because uh, that's more necessary when you're doing longer exposures. And it unfortunately, uh, thermoelectric cooling generates a lot of heat besides moving heat. So we don't really need to dump a bunch of heat right into the light path of the telescope here. So, uh, I haven't seen any reason in the stuff I've been doing that I'm like, this is noisy, it needs to be cool. So, uh, that's something you control with the software though. Um, so the setup basically, we've got two monitors in the uh, observing room where there was just the one TV set before. The upper monitor is going to have what we call the public software on it. It's going to have the main imaging software that's showing the picture that the main camera is getting. And uh, that feed, that, that HDMI feed, is cloned. It's sent over to the, uh, oops, it's sent over to the uh, exhibit room in the other observatory, to the, uh, to the monitor there. And we'll talk in a minute about where we're putting yet another monitor at the DBO. The bottom monitor is for the operator, for the telescope operator, and it'll generally probably have software going on it to help aim the telescope. So uh, and I'll get into those things. So those, again, those of you who had been out to the observatory with the old setup, there was just one TV down here, and now there's two much larger monitors built into cabinet in the wall there. Um, so this is the, the thing. We are going to also be adding a really big TV, a 50-inch TV, on the drop-down wall. I'll show a picture of that in place later if you have control picturing this. So it'll be outside on the south end of the observatory because when we have 100 people out there, that little telescope room is not big enough. Um, it gets crowded really fast. It's greatly improved that we put an exterior door in it when we resited the building a year or two ago but it still isn't big enough, so uh, we're adding an outdoor monitor to, uh, that will feature, again, the main imaging software. Uh, on the telescope also, there's the uh, a finder camera, which was put in as a video camera um, a number of years ago. We've replaced the video camera in it with another digital camera. It's this uh, black and white, or monochrome, better way of saying it, um, ZWO. This actually has a much smaller chip in it. It's really fairly similar to the size of the video cameras because the scale that we were getting before is actually quite good. Um, this camera, I'll show you images of it in a few minutes, but uh, this camera with the lens that it's on, the 70 millimeter lens it's on, gives us a field of view of about five degrees, which is similar to what many people would have in their finder scope. So you're seeing a wider area of sky to help you aim the main telescope. Software. Um, we are doing all of our initial work now. 
with uh, two different packages of software. We're uh, using SharpCap, which anybody who does imaging, digital imaging, is probably familiar with, for the main camera. Um, one of the reasons we went this direction, first off, the base version of it is free, which is nice, but um, it features controls for doing what they in England call the electronically assisted astronomy. Um, it's just live viewing from my point of view. Um, and so it mimics what we were doing with the TV cameras, basically. It uh, lets you show in real time with maybe six second frames or two second frames or something like that, uh, exposures, what the camera is looking at. So uh, sharp cap, um, this again is showing two, on the two different monitors, this again was during the playtime and getting things set up, the top monitor showing what the full chip of the camera sees and the little ring in the middle of it and the bottom monitor uh, showing a zoomed in version of the ring nebula which is more like what we will show the public is something with more magnification but the top one being much easier to find things with. Drew, do you know what the zoom level is on the bottom one? Is that one to one? It says 100%, okay. so uh, yeah. Um, I've pushed it up to 200 on a couple of things. If it was really if it was a small planetary, this is that's actually a luxury we'll have with this that we didn't have with the video, is being able to go even higher magnification than the little video chip could. Because, uh, well, the ring is one of the smaller things that we would show the public, but um, there are a lot of smaller things yet, so. Uh, a lot of potential targets. Um, so yeah, this is the software. Again, it's fairly complex. This is the uh, peril of going digital, is you don't just have a camera and a telescope and a monitor, you have software. But uh, there are a lot of controls for adjusting the camera performance and the screen output. Uh, you can see the histogram now at the bottom. You can slide the uh, ends of the histogram in and out, um, the color balance is in here, all of the gain, all of the exposure things are in here, and they're not uh, 1 to 10 scales or 1 to 4 scales, they're 1 to 1,000 scales usually. So, uh, and, and, and again, the shakedown work I've done with it, um, it's interesting how 458 is actually a lot different than 471. So, um, this is going to require a lot of playing with to see what some, how you're getting the optimum results and things. Fortunately, the software has uh, this preset capability. Uh, they call it profiles, but uh, you can set all of these scales, and some of these scales are um, shrunk now, uh, like thermal controls. Again, we're not doing it mostly. Um, uh, some of the uh, main uh, capture things are shrunk because we're just using the whole chip. But um, this is image controls. This is exposure and gain, all up in here. But you can set all of these things and then save it as a profile. And the plan would be that we'll have uh, sets of these profiles ready to use. So if you know that you're doing deep sky and twilight, you can load that profile and that will be something that we've figured it'll get you pretty much close into the range of what will give you a good image. Or for planet, or for deep sky in the middle of the night, or whatever. Um, we'll probably have a, a bank of nicely labeled profiles that'll make it easier, or presets as I call them up here. Uh, again, I'll repeat, here's our Neighborville sky that never gets much darker than it is out there. <laughs> um, and our goal is to cheat and make it look like you're in a dark place by darkening up the sky and bringing back out the objects. For the Finder camera, um, we're using the ASI software that comes from ZWO. Um, it's similar. Again, we have a monochrome camera for this, so you're not seeing color. This is that wide-angle view. Uh, these are the two stars at the bottom of the parallelogram of Lyra. And so you're seeing it about five degrees across here. I haven't actually measured it. Uh, that's something to do one of these days, is figure out precise dimensions of this. But the goal with setting this camera, which also has a lot of options for how you make it appear here, my goal for when I use it 
will be to make the screen image look like the gravimetria chart. If the stars show up on here, I want them to show up on here. If uh, they don't show up on there, I don't really want to see them here because I look at the chart and look at this and say, where is the thing I want to look at? In other words, if you zoom in a little bit, this star, you can see the three over it and the fainter ones in here, and here's the three over it and the fainter ones in there. And so this makes it really easy to, uh, our old video camera was like this, and the way it's mounted on the telescope, this is always correct north, south, east, west. You just take the chart out, you aim it at a star, and you can see, and then everything else is displayed in front of you. Again, you can do different things with this camera. You can set it so it shows even more stars or fewer or whatever, but the standard preset will be to try to make it look like the Uranometria charts that we have out there. Um, the another nice thing about this software is it has a target overlay on it. So because you need to center your object to uh, have it show up then in the narrower field view of the main camera, this is um, M13 there. So some of the brighter deep sky objects will show up in the finder view too, so that'll make things a little bit easier too for finding things. Um, the colors on the screens, both of these software packages are set, in these examples, these are screenshots, are set to their night friendly modes and it's like, yeah, that'd be great, but why do you have a white button down there? <laughs> That's really annoying, you know? Uh, or the border, the scroll bar is white or whatever to be. Oh, I had to go home and look up how you go into a Windows registry to change the, uh, the, the uh, top bar of the software when it's an inactive window because it was white all the time, even in Windows red mode. So, uh, um, we'll work out some of those bugs. But, uh, again, going back to what we're trying to accomplish here is pull things out of Naperville Sky and being able to put them on the screen. Now we could still show people the Ring Nebula in the 16 inch in the uh, Riley Observatory for sure, but um, there's a lot of fainter things, especially when you get, there's not many galaxies you can see at all, you know, visually out there to any notable extent. You can see the uh, nucleus of the uh, Andromeda Galaxy, but you know, not too much else. But Again, the goal of this observatory is to, when people are out there visiting, to say, yes, this telescope here is taking that image right now, it's on the wall. And I will say, I'm sure I've told a lot of you this before, but when we first put in the video gear in the original setup, I really didn't know how people would respond to it, but I found that they really do connect with the idea that this telescope that they're standing next to is taking this picture because any of us could pull out our phone and look up the uh, Hubble Space Telescope photo of the Ring Nebula and put it on the screen, and it would be more spectacular than that. And I thought, well, if it's on the screen, do they just think it in the same way? But uh, it really seems that people connect with this being live and right now and from right here. So uh, that, that has been a good outcome. Let's see, where else did I get into? Ah, so next steps. Um, we are aiming at, <laughs> we've got the uh, encoders on the telescope mount talking to, directly to the PC. And the goal being that we're going to have software like Stellarium or, and or Card to CL, which is already on the computer out there, that you can pull up, do a couple of alignment steps, and then have it know where the telescope is pointed. So you would be able to pull up one of these planetarium packages, search for an object, um, have it show where it is, and then you'd have the crosshair for where the telescope is pointing, and you'd be able to use it. It's, it's still a push-through telescope, but you'd be able to use it to help aim the telescope at an object. So uh, this is in process. We, we're part way along. It's just a matter of getting at the settings for ASCOM and things correctly to uh, have the one end talk to the other end. But other people are doing it, so we'll figure it out too. Um, Again, that would be something you'd put up on, in this illustration, I've got the uh, finder cam view on the bottom screen, but you might flip that window to being uh, Solarium instead and show you where you are in the sky, which is handy too, considering 
it's hard to look up and see the sky all out there some nights. So, uh, um, so the outdoor monitor, again, the south ball building drops down. I hope most of you have been out there. We are going to add a 50-inch monitor out there that'll mirror that main output of the uh, public view of things. Again, for when, that build, when the room gets too crowded for people inside, people outside will be able to see that. It's facing to the south. Um, we don't normally set up telescopes over by the porta potty anyway, but uh, so anybody to the east or north of the building won't see the light from that, but uh, it'll increase the viewing area. Um, we are working toward improving, seeing, improving uh, ease of focus on the telescope in a couple of ways. Uh, those of you familiar with Botanoff masks, uh, this is one with that telescope. It's uh, a fairly effective way of focusing when you're doing imaging. Um, it's hard to focus well in a live video uh, view of things because brighter things tend to look fuzzier anyway. They tend to bloom out somewhat. Um, the bottom off mask creates the diffraction spikes. You see there's three diffraction spikes. Um, the outer two form a wedge that whatever that degrees is, it's 18 degrees or something, I can't remember. The center one actually move, uh, moves as you go in and out of focus. You might notice that it's not quite perfectly centered between the uh, two outer ones. It's slightly off to the this way's left. Um, that means the telescope isn't in perfect focus. We're looking toward having a uh, bottom off mask that's right with the telescope that's easy to deploy and uh, so the focus out there tends to change through the night if you start observing at the end of a warm day and everything's at kind of 80 degrees and by later in the night it's gotten down to 60 um, that, that'll shift the focus it's not mechanically it's not very much it's fractions of a millimeter probably but it's enough to make the focus a little soft so being able to rapidly refocus we're also looking at in addition to having the coarse focus with the camera attaches to the telescope, of putting a fine focus in by moving the primary mirror forward and back a small amount, which would be faster to do and could be done uh, probably motorized as well, that'll end up being. So uh, that'll make, I think, make things quicker, and uh, especially when you're doing group events, you like things to be quicker. Uh, we'll have definitely improved streaming capabilities. Um, we do, we're doing streaming out there starting back in 2020 when we were locked down. Um, but our streaming consisted of putting pointing a camera at the TV monitor and uh, or, or at a computer monitor. And that's not a very good way of capturing and sharing images. So uh, now our images will be inside a computer and we'll be able to stream directly from there. So. Uh, we should have good capabilities for doing that, rather than the rather crude pointing a camera at uh, the uh, TV set thing. Um, getting along here. Oh, and then there's this. Um, all of, both of those sets of software, both on the Finder camera and certainly on the main camera, that software is all built for doing imaging with. So uh, if members want to, or the club decides it needs to for some reason or another, we'll be able to capture images, we'll be able to capture, capture video, we'll be able to capture just about anything you want that the cameras and the software are capable of doing. So if people are interested in doing the series of exposures that you want to then take home and process, um, that capability will be there. And um, yeah, so that's kind of my run through of what's there. Um, this is the goal, again, uh, to, uh, I mean, the, the DVO, I think, has proved its worth. It's always been popular at our group events out there. But uh, hopefully this new setup will uh, last, you know, the 15 years that the last one did. Um, who knows what the technology will be <laughs> at that time. I know I won't be worried about it, so <laughs> that'll be somebody else. So is there anything else that anybody wants to add or ask? Um, I know. I know Tony's here. Tony is the uh, godfather of this project, so uh, <laughs> he can I tell you about so how much everything costs. The only thing I'd add is, you know, what you said about possibly in the future doing 
you know, your own astral photography there. But one of the things we are looking at is once we get everything straightened out, just like the GDRO, and we could use more people there, is to have people come out and get trained on that, learn how to use it, and then volunteer to work nights when uh, we have people out there. And once you are a key holder, you know, there's a thing, I think it's up on the web, where you can assign yourself a night and go out on your own, you know, just let Springbrook know you're coming out and uh, work with it. But we're, we're looking forward to that part of it, of other people being able to use it. I'm especially looking forward. <laughs> <laughs> one guy especially is looking forward, yeah. Because I ended up running the old one for basically because of that 200 power thing and everybody else saying they couldn't find anything on the telescope. So, uh, and that was really one of the reasons for hooking it up to planetary software, too, to just kind of make it easier for those of us who can't look up in the sky and find everything. But uh, that we'd have another tool there for people to use. And again, I think it would be fair to say that uh, it won't be long before we might be publishing a date or two to go out there for hands-on training and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we Again, it's basically operational now. We have to... Uh, There's a, there's a camera bracket that I've got sitting at my home that needs to go in to hold the camera oriented correctly and hold its cabling in and out. If it's all finished, it needs to get installed. Um, but uh, the documentation and the working out, there were a lot of bugs. <laughs> there's some goofy things with the software that you don't know until you try it, but now we can teach people how to work around the bugs. So, uh, anything else? Any other questions or comments? The, uh TV and the other uh, and the GRO is that up and running as well? Yeah, that's been replaced with a computer monitor. So uh, it matches the public monitor that's uh, in this. So, uh, which are both, those are set at uh, about as, well, they're set at 4K basically. So, uh, well, I, th I thought they were. Well, they think they are. The specs on them, I put them what I would call 2K. <laughs> yeah. But it goes at the, the splitter, we, we figured out that's what Oh, the splitter 4K. thinks it's 4K. The splitter's but, okay. a 4K. Anyway, the they're nice high resolution, they're, they're a pair of good high resolution monitors. Yeah. It took us a while to figure out how to set their brightnesses down to zero, but uh, <laughs> they are now. So. Uh, and we'll do the same thing. The TV set will get in over the next month or so, probably. Okay. So we'll get, we'll get there. It needs to be wired in and all. And uh, then part of the training will be how to open and close the south wall without slamming it too hard because it'll have a TV hanging on it. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yes? Um, this doesn't have anything to do directly with that, but the degradation of the sky mm -hmm. over that period you were referring to, was that like slow and steady or did that you know, happen at certain certain times? I think it's or? been it's been uh, it's probably there were some steeper bits of the curve, but I think it's been pretty much a, a line, <laughs> you know, that's just been, and it continues to get worse. When uh, the communities around Chicagoland, especially towards the southwest quadrant of Chicagoland, started switching out to the stupid white LEDs, it's gone up a lot, because uh, the light pollution from them is considerably worse. But, uh, but there wasn't much around here in the even in the early 80s, I was here in the mid 80s, and 59 is about as far as stuff. Yeah, but this is like, I mean, in the early 70s, we used to complain about Chicago because the sky glow dome of Chicago went up 25, 30 degrees <laughs> into the sky. It was mercury vapor blue, and then it was just dark the rest of the way up. You didn't see Naperville unless there was a game at the high school football stadium and they turned in the lights and then there would be this little peak of light that came out of Naperville. That was the 70s. I mean, it's uh, And then that Chicago, that little dome that we complained about just came up and swept over like a tidal wave. And uh, it's been there ever since. Uh, I know Plainfield is, according to the latest census, just under 50,000. So that's a good example of growth even that far out. Oh, yeah. Well, there's growth, and then, but the lighting's just getting worse, so, uh, especially the switch to white lights. I mean, these yellow lights weren't put in to be make less light pollution, but they do uh, because they're yellow instead of being blue. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is something that uh, we will always face here, and 
people have periodically over the years said, why don't we move out farther? But what we do at the AEC is primarily outreach and group events for ourselves even. And a lot of those things don't translate to drive an extra two hours and go down a gravel road yeah. for 10 miles and then up a dirt path for a mile and stuff. Um, we can't send the scouts out to do that sort of thing. So that's why we've kept the facility here. It's also an ideal place logistics wise. It may not seem like it, but we have wonderful security that we wouldn't have with our observatories being out in the middle of a farm field in a unmonitored spot. So uh, anyway, anything else? Yeah, I am finished. Thank you.